we at STIR are proud to present a conversation with Mr. Hanif Mohammad Khara and congratulate Mr. Khara for being recognized with Order of British Empire Award recently. Thank you, Mr. Khara, for giving us this opportunity and coming onto the platform. We at STIR are very, very happy to host you today. A small introduction for Mr. Khara. Mr. Khara is a structural engineer and is design director and co-founder of London-based structural engineering practice, AKT2, previously known as Adam Kara Taylor. He has taught design internationally, is a member of Board of Trustees for the Architecture Foundation, and was a commissioner for Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment for 2008 to 2011. He is currently professor in practice of architectural technology at Harvard Graduate School of Design. He also taught as professor of architect architecture technology at KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm from 2009 until 2012. Mr. Kara was born in Bombo, Uganda, and currently lives in London with his wife and two daughters. Thank you, Mr. Kara, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. To start with, um, congratulations again to be recognized with the Order of British Empire Award. Um, what was your first emotion and a reaction the moment you got that award? Uh, overwhelming joy is what I keep feeling because um, historically, as you already said, you know, I was born in East Africa and grew up there before I came here, although I'm three generations back of Indian origin. So when you're living in a colony and as a child, you have a picture of the queen quite often in the house. So somehow there's an influence from that era and then watching what they do as you grow up to be recognized and acknowledged by a nation for three things, you know, the, the three citation, the citation recognizing for architecture, engineering and education all at the same time is uh, it's quite, quite tearfully over overwhelming to begin with. Yeah. Um, yeah. The first ones, of course, about the conception of uh, your practice itself and how that came about. Yeah. So the practice is 25 years old and it was born out of uh, a kind of frustration in that, you know, by the time I was 34, I, I felt that I could do almost anything in structural engineering, make buildings stand up, but also uh, frustration that the discipline was not recognized enough, uh, unlike other disciplines in, in the world where the value system uh, allows them to be, you know, established by that point. But I had a passion for that discipline and wanted to reorganize not only the value system as it sees us, but also push our own discipline through a, a very deep understanding of how to make things, not just design, but how to make. So up until that point, my history was in very hardcore engineering. You know, I, I worked for a very standard process of doing a graduate degree and then straight away doing an apprenticeship in drawing, then an engineering uh, chartership. So I got to that point technically fairly quickly, but also the nature of the work was very different. I was in the north of England, so I was work. I worked on offshore oil rigs, roller coasters and things. But then when we came down south and, and I started to think about buildings and how they affect people's lives and then get frustrated that we were always second or third in terms of the, the process. Uh, and the, there was a huge recession in sight in, in 95, 96. The option I had was really to get out of the industry and start something because I was young enough or to push it so that when it comes out of a recession, you would have a success. So that was the kind of formative thinking as a, let's say a business strategy. Um, the, the disciplinary strategy was, well, if we survive through that process was how can we reorganize and rethink the way we are perceived and how can we support better the world of design, not just the world of um, engineering, but the world of design, which is a bigger concept from making a city to making buildings, you know, micro and macro. And that would take a little longer. We knew that because we're judged uh, as engineers by what you make stand up. It's unlike an architect, you know, who's judged by synthesizing or coming up with brilliant ideas. 
I think with an engineer, there is always a, a, a rightfully so. The first test is what did you make stand up? So we already had a quite a clear idea that a few years in, we would arrive that point when we would be in command of what we wanted to do and how we wanted to do it. But up until that point, we would just prove ourselves by making buildings other people said were not possible or were too expensive or, you know, couldn't be done. So we started like that. We started to practice like that. And that's the, on the website, I think the diagram is saying retrospectively year four or five, we started to explode and say, well, what do we, what, how do we now frame this so that rather than wait, it actually becomes a driving force for other people to come to us. And that component was really partly born with holding on to making, but also education because I went straight to teach at the AA at that time. And I started to look at how architects thought and how they developed and how you, you know, create cities, how do you enter competitions? And I started to teach quite heavily. And, and fortunately for me, it was a very good time. Some of the best architects in the world were there at that point. And I was beginning to pick up and not only improve their way of thinking, but also take some of it to migrate into how engineers should think. So that was the formation. And then the rest is kind of history. During conceiving a project or even building or uh, making the project realize, from the time you've started to where we are, given the fact that there's intervention of technology, given the fact that there is a changing human behavior and the way design and architecture is perceived and, and um, you know, and lived in or, or experienced in, um, you've, you must have cut across various genres and generations of, of co-designing with fellow architects and designers. What, if you have to summarize in a few lines, what is the fundamental difference you witness? The fundamental, obviously right now, if we go in reverse, is the issues of climate and how we deal with it, which weren't so prevalent uh, when we started. Probably, you know, five or six years in, the most prevalent thing was the arrival of technology and how to deal with it, how to use it to, to only do the basic stuff if we wanted to survive as disciplines. If you fast forward to today, that's a must have. Everybody has that now. So where is the bigger difference you can make in, 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 in terms of changing the world or making the world a better place or different? I say, you know, the climate is one. I think the globalization impact over the last 10 years and putting COVID aside has also become a prevalent in practice. So whether you're here or, or in India or in Saudi, if you want to be the best in your discipline, you need to know about everyone else. You, you can no longer hide and, and seek in terms of your own little world and you need to deal with the globalization, both in the difficulties it brings and short changes society, but also in the productive aspects that it could bring to how we do design, how we do construction and so on. So I, I would say that that shift has allowed practices to sharpen themselves more. You either head towards becoming 20,000, 30,000 massive offices, or you hold on to a discipline and don't become a generalist. And, and now there's a, an inequity already, we see it. You know, there are very many practices who deal with big making countries and cities, but there are very few people who deal with the micro level of a building and how to improve the, the element or the micro level. So there's a separation now that I see that wasn't so evident. So I see these changes being now written by the demands of climate, the demands of building less, the demands of technology, because technology is so fast now at, at doing some of the basic stuff that you have to say, well, what does the human do to that? How do you stay sharper and how do you confirm or, or deny, in my case, confirm that you can't do without a brain and a hand, no matter how good the technology is? That would be my, my take on it. In, in so many different locations across the globe. Um, what are some of the different experiences that you've encountered, um, especially with computational and engineering uh, aspects in, in uh, 
in in different locations you know what it's interesting it's always an interesting question right this one because i i still retreat into saying that when you're in london you're fortunate because you do see most of the world because it does go through london one way or the other whether it's technically or theoretically or historically it's a fortunate place so on one hand uh, the lens we look through is very sharp and we're very quick to see um, areas that are less developed and areas that are better developed and by that i don't mean uh, equity i mean in terms of the discipline so i come across the world where engineers are already running the country but they wouldn't know how to stand a building uh, i come across uh, places where contractors and constructors are so good that our design is not good enough to keep up with them because their craft skills are so good and india is one of these places you know when you find really good crafts people it makes me very envious because you know we wouldn't design for them because we would design for a lesser cap capacity and a lesser ability to 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 hand use equally when you go to the most developed parts of the world like say germany or switzerland where we work you know that automation is is big you know that technology is fast and you have to design to suit and challenge some of those areas and this this contra let's say the polarity between these two understandings of of uh, the sharpest end of how one designs and builds against the the, the bluntest end is very interesting because there isn't a a kind of easy answer to whether you pick one or the other what it tells you is if you don't know both you can't do the other better so you find it all the time and that's one of the things that keeps the passion in the practice going we find you know when we're working internationally sometimes there's just an acceptance that we know what we're talking about and when we're working in new york recently you know with the the vessel there's just an an assumption that you know we don't know as much as the american you know, that so so you you're always negotiating technically in, in these situations and and it it's part of the fun because in a way it keeps you alive it keeps you rethinking what should be taught and how we should negotiate these areas so i i think as well as working across geographies working across scales and working across materiality and craft skills and technological skills these polarities are the most exciting part of design we were uh, you preempted what we were going to because negotiating uh functionality aesthetics experimentation um and any part of the world requires a great synergy and collaboration you know and 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 yeah. and that becomes the key uh for all the processes and the creativity which comes out uh, from uh, from a practice i would love to hear some of the anecdotes it could some fun anecdotes or some happy anecdotes and some anecdotes which you have been very proud of uh, some examples um uh, during the time you uh, you experiment with all this uh, yeah i mean it depends where i pick in history but if i was to start right now we're just about to open um the the theater in rabat in morocco which will be by its by Zaha Hadid architects before she passed away but it took us like almost 9 years to build it oh. and when we first conceived it it is so much about the thinking and work of Zaha that anybody who looks at it would first question whether it would ever fit into the heritage craft skills uh, culture of of architecture in Morocco but when you now look at it finished you can kind of see that the pain that we went through from conceiving it and everybody questioning it through to every step of the way finding people who can make it and build it and so on and so on has been worth it because in that time things have also changed drastically and would we conceive the same thing today probably not you know so there's a benefit and a and a disbenefit but equally there's a pride into the story say of um other parts of the world if you look at this city london where most things have been done often we run through peckham library i think early on where most people wondered why 
the columns were kind of slanted and, you know, they thought it was a joke. They thought it wasn't technically understood as a, as a kind of technical device until we explained that this changing in geometry was the benefit of, of, of having a computational drive so that we could work with the group of columns that could stabilize the building. So it wasn't ad hocness from the architect. It wasn't ad hocness from us. It was a very clever understanding of geometry in the early days of what today is called parametric design. It's just geometry. We are currently working in Abu Dhabi where you know we've done several projects. The first one was Mazda City which was probably the largest experiment that we've ever been involved in. And this was conceived as a city, zero carbon city, you know, 15, 20 years ago, before we start, all started to talk about it. And it needed a brave client and an extreme environment. And, and the first paradox is why would you, why would you do a zero carbon city in a desert where it's actually impossible? Well, partly because you need a bold client who's willing to do that research. So it was born out of a big piece of research at MIT and Harvard that this may be possible. But why I tell you the anecdote is that in some ways it failed because it built one large piece and then stopped commercially. In another way, it confirmed something that Foster and Partners and us and everybody who worked on it knew, which was that this resistance to uh, uh, the modernization can be reinterpreted. So we went to Yemen and looked at those cities with large, tall mud towers that had been built hundreds of years ago, naturally ventilated, very close together. We could understand from the past, which was done intuitively, and apply technological solutions to bring those things into Mazda. And then if I jump right across to two of the buildings, if I were to, more recently, we have been drawn into how do we re-engineer buildings? Um, because the, the demand for not knocking buildings down in this part of the world is much bigger. And there's an acceptance that there's a valuable thing to do to save even a 1970s building. So we, we did a few years ago, a, a, a 32 story building and we added 11 stories on top of it, which, which anecdotally sounds like nothing today because we've just done another that 16 floors but at the time, the reason and the logic was partly commercial, that if you knock it down, you would take four years before you start from the ground and it would take too long. You would miss the market. The other was technological, you know, which was if you look at material carefully with the technology we have today, we can reduce material. We can understand the forensic better now than we did in 1970. So why can't we use the redundancy of the system? So these sorts of things have, have redefined our discipline. That brings us to uh, where we are. I mean, um, one of the one of the campaign which we're starting for at Stir is we saying think next, and think next is becoming a huge manifesto for us. And, yeah. and think next is not just about next generation, but what we as current generation and and with with the practices we all are doing, we as media and you as a practicing. Um, uh, engineer and creator, um, how do we, what do we do next and what do we, what do we have to think next? Um, and that brings us to the second section of this interview and this conversation between us is the role which education play in Think Next and the role which education needs to play in Think Next. So as an educator, what are, the, what are, are some of the critical changes and new ideas uh, that you have seen emerge within the contemporary classroom and where would you like to go uh, keeping the next in mind? Yeah, no, it's a very tough, very tough question because I, of course, have been at GSD now for over 15 years. Quite a lot of time of that, I've been a professor in practice, but I come across colleagues who are full-time professors over there and practice less. And what I find is the, uh, the overlap of the two in terms of the necessity to do history theory uh, and knowledge capacity, building the knowledge at the same time as an understanding of what the world needs immediately. How do you edu educate for both the immediacy of both 
rather than selecting one or the other. And this happens mostly in interdisciplinary uh, conversations, not in singular con conversations about, say, history or technology or whatever course or seminar you, you teach, where it, it grows massively when you teach something that is special, but you in, invite the other to come into it and then change the conversation. So the future in that sense, in terms of the next designers and, and makers, but also you have to teach the next teachers in terms of trying to get into a position where they are responding better to history. They're responding to the canons that we all know are familiar. We all know some of those canons have been destructive you know, to, to society. How can we shift those canons? How can we just allow more inclusive canons, more uh, pluralistic concepts? And I've learned, I've been very fortunate because for about the same amount of time I've been involved with the Aga Khan Award of Architecture. So I've learned all the things we didn't know because you get exposed to all parts of the world, all sorts of people acting as an architect. They're not trained or a I think. I'm very fortunate because of the institution I'm associated with right now in that I hear so many of the best people in the world in disciplines at faculty meetings or when we're teaching together. And I feel, you know, that we are all in the process of reinventing a number of areas and bringing not only, as you say, the next generation, but the next thinking. Okay. And we accept that predicting the future is pretty impossible, but if you don't prepare for the ability to see something when it's coming at you, that's what education does, is allows you the visibility to do something about it. And, and taking the climate agenda, that's one thing, because what I'm, what I'm finding is that the, the, the data science and technology can show you so much more about the harm you're doing than you've ever done. You have no right, even as a student, to ignore that data. So you've been on various juries and panels for uh, international awards, the Aga Khan being one of them. We also were wondering if you could elaborate on what you believe is the importance and significance of these um, many now. There used to be only a handful, but now a lot more. Uh, but this global recognition. Uh... Well, the, the first thing is it touches the human heart to, to be recognized and rewarded for anything you know, it, it, it just, it, it, you have to have it because you can't operate in a void. The, the difficulty is when, it, you know, is it a risk or a reward to get an, a, an award? Because sometimes there's such a proliferation of it that the, the intelligentsia um, generally recognize it as something you pay for rather than being rewarded for something that you did well. So, you have to make that distinction. You know, the, I've been fortunate in being involved with the Commission for Architectural Built Environment and, and a number of awards, including the Aga, the Aga Khan Award, where the process of, of selection is so rigorous that you just know it's essential that if you, if you do select somebody, you are changing their life. You're definitely changing their life and you're changing the world because Selecting a few people, you know, in, in the time I've been involved, we've had people like, say, Francis Kerry, who's now a friend from Burkina Faso, had never done anything outside his country. Look at him now, you know, and then you also join forces, join hands with, with other jurors who are from philosophy or architecture, like Raoul or David Ajay. And we have a discourse about selecting, which is beyond just judging a taste. I, I have a... I have a soft side on, on, on awards. I, I deliberately want to take part. I am very lucky to be a, an engineer who speaks clearly in, in design terms. So I get selected quite often and, and I get to learn from them because I also see process. Um, personally, I feel that they should be around and they should be under scrutiny in terms of how they are judged and what is the process that they go through in order to reward. Um, and therefore, once that's done and, and the practitioner should make his own decision whether he wants to enter or not. A lot of uh, you, you are on panels and education boards as well, which are also again across geographies, much like your practice. So 
in terms of the academia, right, the academic uh, uh, environment, is there a distinction or are there any similarities that kind of stand out? Of course, of course. And, and the, it is inevitable because so many of them are, are based on history and, and resource, you know. Uh, the AA has, has uh, because of its constraints, it has created more Pritzker Prize winners. Everybody knows. And the history of where it is matters a lot. It's in the middle of a square in London where you can't ignore architecture. You know, it's, there's so much history about architecture as soon as you walk out of the AA. It also then carries with it the, the history of the people that have been through it. If you inverse that to, say, GSD at Harvard, a similar situation in that it is part of a very important, massive university, but it's a small part of the design school. And it's unusual to have access to all the other disciplines nearby that shape the world. I mean, they are not small institutions. They shape economics, politics, medicine, and you cannot feel anything but inspired if you are in these environments and you automatically bump into all these disciplines and ways of thinking. So there is a, a difference between size and scale, but creating an atmosphere can't happen overnight, I think. You have to have some history, just like buildings, and you have to have some future. So, you know, some of the institutions are running out of the future because what is beginning to happen uh, in, in my opinion. So I've also lectured in many parts of the world, uh, Turkey, Africa, all over the place. I don't think I've done a lecture in India, but I've done one in Bangladesh and, and Pakistan. So what I've seen is some of the most talented, I can give you the example of Bangladesh where I was the year of COVID. Some of the most talented architects um, in young architects I did workshops with, but they don't get the access to do the kind of projects that you would from the AA. So geography matters, yet they understand the climate change faster than any of us because they're living in it. So you, you've got to say that, you know, the place they're from and where the institutions are does have a massive impact. There is an unfairness about that in that if you can't afford to be in the, in the rich big schools, you probably make it slightly differently and, and slightly later. But I do feel that the common thing about all of this is they teach you a way of thinking. And, and that's so important because that's the only thing you can take from one place to another. You can't take your climate with you and you can't take your, 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 your world with you. But you can take a way of thinking and come over to another part of the world and reorganize the way they think. So I, I think it's important to have these big institutions uh, and focal points in the world where there is sharing of knowledge and sharing of understanding and not being afraid of the other is so important. You know, when I was in Bangladesh, I, I said to some of the students, you know, don't, don't think that the people at the AA know a lot more than you. It's not like that. You, you reach out and, and, and collaborate with people so that you can actually see that for yourselves and, and vice versa. Yep. Um, <clears throat> Completely. Any, any last note, Mr. Kar, if you have to, uh, end this conversation with something. Yeah, there are two projects you should know about. One is in Iraq, which is the central bank. Recently, there was a rocket fired and there's a YouTube video just past it. So for me, the human story is about projects like that. It's taken us 10 years to build the damn thing and we built it to avoid uh, destruction. The other one is Bloomberg's headquarters in London with Norman Foster, which today stands as the greenest workspace and won the Sterling Prize. So. I think you should know that we've won the, four, the selling price four times. That that one was criticized heavily by other people here because they said, well, it's expensive. Of course it would win. It wasn't the money. If you gave somebody else that money, uh, they wouldn't have been able to do what Foster's did so, yeah. uh, or that client. This, this is the kind of thinking that I always promote is that don't, don't just make judgments without knowing what's behind some of these projects.